Um, okay, thanks, Bill and Penny and the, the organisers for inviting me here. Um, as you can tell, I'm British, so I think that was the chief, the chief draw of me is the British accent. So um, my talk is probably a bit of a, a curveball. It might be a bit more philosophical than um, the, the previous talk. Um, I am not a I'm not an academic. I'm, I'm probably the only speaker here who doesn't have a PhD. Um, so take everything I say with a pinch of salt. You know. um, yeah, well, <laughs> maybe, maybe even more, maybe even more so with me. They're, they're, what, what I'm going to be presenting are, are basically ideas, and, and all, our, all our ideas are provisional. Um, but it's re it does follow on from the last talk because it's really it, this. The natural intelligence paradigm is really connected with this idea of nature's genius. We, we, you know, is that a metaphor, or, or is nature ingenious? Um, is, does evolution involve certain in intelligent characteristics in terms of what evolution um, can do? And we've been playing around, the, all the various talks, we've, we've been playing around with various um, entertaining uh, terminology, and the, the word intelligence is, is, is almost like a taboo word, but I think it all comes down to whether life is an intelligence and whether, whether evolving life is, I'm going to argue that evolving life is an intelligence unto itself. Um, I want to just quickly moan about something. Uh, Bill gave an interview with an online uh, magazine about four or five weeks ago. It was a good interview. Um, and at the end, they mentioned, it was about this forum, and at the end, they mentioned some of the uh, presenters, and they mentioned me, and they said I was a student of hallucinogenic mushrooms. <laughs> I was stra straight on the phone to the lawyer, you know, about that. Um, <laughs> what kind of talk is that, student of hallucinogenic mushrooms? Um, stu student of nature who's, who's made use of uh, psilocybin mushrooms or entheogenic mushrooms. Um, or psychedelic mushrooms. Not, no, no one in the field uses the term uh, hallucinogenic or hallucinogen. It's a sort of misnomer, and it gets, it's a bit pejorative. So um, what, what I think I am, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in how we interpret life and how we interpret evolution. And that's, that means, uh, that brings us to her, hermeneutics. And hermeneutics, that sounds good, Right, probably that might be a new word to some hermeneutics. I only learnt it. So I don't have a PhD, so I only picked that word up quite recently. Um, <laughs> so uh, it, it sounds good. Her, uh, it sounds good. Yeah, it sounds like I've got a PhD. You know, hermeneutics. <laughs> so um, her, her, hermeneutics is the art and science of interpretation, and uh, traditionally that's been the interpretation of religious texts, but. Hermeneutics is now spreading into various uh, academic disciplines. And for instance, a book came out this year called Interpreting Nature, the Emerging Field of Environmental Hermeneutics. So it's all about how we interpret nature, and that's what I'm interested in. So, I, so I am, I'm aspiring to be a, a hermeneuticist. And given that, um, psilocybin mushrooms kind of nudged me on, on that path. I, I think what I am is a psilocybinetic biohermeneuticist. And that's, <laughs> that, that's what they should have said, that's what they should have put in that article, yeah? I mean, it would have given the spell checker a good run for its money. Yeah. Um, so, um, so hermeneutics then, how we interpret life and how we, that's what this whole forum has been about life. You know, and, uh, and the evolution of life, because <coughs> life evolves. Um, so how do we interpret life and evolution? So uh, why are hermeneutics important? I can just give a sort of simple illustration. Um, right, so ima imagine a culture where this image was very prominent, and it was, the culture was built around this image, and it was interpreted as being a wine glass, and... Uh, you can imagine certain cultural behaviours and certain cultural values might arise from that being interpreted as a wine glass. You know, it's a practical, utilitarian thing. Now, imagine a shift in perspective, a sudden shift in perspective so that it's two... Can everyone see that's two faces as well, yeah? It's a classic sort of illusion. Um, 
If there was a shift in perspective, so suddenly the culture interpre interpreted that as being two faces, well, the, the, the associations and connotations are different. It's more kind of personal. And, um, and there could be then a change in cultural values and cultural behavior because it's now interpreted differently as faces rather than a wine glass. It's not that the wine glass is wrong. It's just that's one interpretation of, you know, there are different interpretations. And maybe, it, maybe the faces is a, is a, more, a, a healthier uh, interpretation. So that's why hermeneutics, I think, is important. Um, so what, because we're in this, I'm in, in this talk, I'm interested in how we interpret evolution and how we interpret uh, life, how we interpret evolving life. That, that's connected to the, the biggest uh, uh, philosophical question of all, the, the meaning of life, because how we interpret life will determine the, the meaning we give to life. So... And because life is a natural part of the universe, we're in Douglas Adams ter territory, and it's the, what we're interested in is the meaning of life, the universe, and everything. <coughs> That's this our sort of starting point then. So, um, so, and so, um, uh, in this, in this uh, area of inquiry then, the meaning of life, the universe, and everything, notwithstanding philosophers, the... the, the, the Loudest voices, I think, are, are, from the f are from physicists. They get a lot of press. Um, so here's some choice quotes. So here's phys and the, the, the physicists are like the mafia of the science world. So here's a <laughs> physicist, uh, Lawrence Krauss, speaking about the universe. And he's very popular, Lawrence Krauss. So it's big. Rare events happen all the time, including life. But that doesn't mean it's special. Well, how, how, how high do you draw the bar? You know, how, how, if, if, the, if the universe can, can make Lawrence Krauss from scratch and all of us, build all of us from scratch, essentially, and the web, web of life, then, and that doesn't mean it's a special universe. What kind of universe would, would be special? So, um, so that's a questionable uh, hermeneutic, uh, you know, interpretation. Um, here's, here's another one. Another, this is Nobel Prize winning physicist Steven Weinberg. The more the universe seems comprehensible, the more it also seems pointless. I, you know, was he going through a divorce or something when he, when he wrote that? Or... He ate, ate some bad cheese or something, I don't know. But you, you can contrast that with Einstein, who said that the most incomprehensible thing about the universe was its comprehensibility. So what Einstein meant by that, I think, uh, was that the most amazing thing, the most remarkable thing, the most awesome thing about the universe is that it's comprehensible. It's intelligible and we can understand it, which means there's a, an intimate connection between consciousness and the larger system that births consciousness and kind of s sustains consciousness. So, um, again, questionable her interpretations. Um, the last one there allegedly said by nuclear physicist Ernest Rutherford, uh, physics is the only real science, the rest are just stamp collecting. <laughs> Th this leads to this idea of physics envy, that physicists, <laughs> ph phys physicists are like, uh, uh, they like the, the, the giants of the science world and they, they step on biologists and you know, they, <laughs> they psychologists, you call psychology a science, we step on you, and, you know. <laughs> Ecologist, I step on three ecologists at once, you know. So. <laughs> but uh, he, it's not all going to be comedy, by the way. <laughs> um, but uh, ironically, Ernest Rutherford got, he, he received a Nobel Prize for chemistry. So I bet you when he, when he, when he, when he, when he shook hands, he didn't say, oh yeah, fat, I do good stamp collecting, you know. So. <laughs> Anyway, the reason I put that in is I think because life, life and consciousness are the most interesting things about the universe, life and consciousness are the most interesting things about the universe, then it's entirely possible that physics will soon very well become eclipsed by the life sciences like biology and genetics and psychology and neuropsychology and even phenomenology, the study of direct experience. So physics might not always be the sort of the top dog, the, ma the mafia top dog. Um, this is a better one from Max Planck. 
Science cannot solve the ultimate mystery of nature, and it is because in the last analysis, we ourselves are part of the mystery we are trying to solve. Exacto mundo. Um, and I've just added there, also life and consciousness were always poised to come out of nature. Um, it's interesting, I said come out of nature. That's Alan Watts used to say that we don't come into the world, we come out of the world, like apples come out of a tree. It's a very interesting notion. It's, um, so... Yeah, life and consciousness were always po poised to come out of nature. And it's, it's interesting because getting back to physicists again, um, they, they, seem, they talk about what happened, what the, univer what the universe was doing like a millionth of a second after the Big Bang. You ask a physicist what they were doing you know, a couple of weeks ago and they scratch their head, I don't know. But they, they seem to know exactly what the universe was doing a millionth of a second after the Big Bang. But whatever the universe was doing a millionth of a second after the Big Bang, life and consciousness, we know with hindsight, were, were always poised to emerge out of that system. And that's, uh, it's interesting, you know, to say the least. Um, so back to our uh, hermeneutical questions about uh, life, uh, evolving life, and how we interpret evolving life, and the mystery, the meaning of life. Um, I think it all, consciousness is probably the, the most interesting out of, Life and consciousness, consciousness is arguably the most interesting of those two. And we then, in pursuing this mystery, we're let, we're, ultimately we come to the human cortex. We have to address the human cortex because the human cortex is bound up with consciousness as a, a correlation there. Um, so our question then, the real mystery is the human... They say the human cortex is the most complex thing in the, the known universe. So the mystery now is, how did this come to be? How is that there? The hum what, how do we understand the existence of the human cortex? You know? um, when, well, then it's evolution, because if, if that's cortex version 12.0, it evolved from cortex version 11.0, all, all the way back to some ancestral cortex of all currently existing primates, including ourselves. So the mystery, then, is now evolution. What the hell is this evolutionary process that can build the human cortex and everything else we've been talking about in this form. What is evolution? In other words, the, how do we appraise evolution? How is it appraised and how does the science appraise it? Now, I've cherry-picked some... Um, obviously, this is what you do when you give presentations. You kind of cherry-pick. Um, but this is... Uh, if, this, if these weren't typical sentiments, I don't think I'd be here doing this talk and all the work I do. You know, They are... There is a general, they are general sentiments in this kind of scientific paradigm. So evolution uh, is normally talked about as being dumb and mindless. It's normally talked about as being blind. There's Richard Dawkins' uh, The Blind Watchmaker. Uh, selfish genes, of course, which are still, that's, that's another Richard Daw Dawkins uh, notion, and it's still in the this kind of collective psyche. Uh, degenerate code. In, in Richard, I, I love Richard Dawkins. He's a brilliant writer. I think he's, he's got blind spots, but he's, he is a brilliant writer. But in Richard Dawkins' fairly recent book, The Ancestor's Tale, he actually goes out of his way to point out that the genetic code is degenerate. There are 20 amino acids that life uses. There are 64 possible codons in the DNA. Therefore, some of those codons code for the same amino acid. So apparently the correct term is that the gen genetic code is... Uh, Degenerate. I mean, you know, should it go to a reform school or something? It's an interesting use of language. Um, cludges. Evolution is talked about in terms of cludges. About um, seven or eight years ago, uh, in response to the intelligent design movement, and do not confuse the natural intelligence paradigm that I promote with the intelligent des design movement. It's a different thing. Um, in response to the intelligent design movement about uh, seven or eight years ago, because there were a lot of books coming out from the ID people, um, scientists, biologists were prone to start sort of ridiculing the ID, uh, by, by ridiculing the ID uh, movement by showing how badly designed certain things were. So they started talking about cludges, that uh, organisms were kind of cludged together, a bit like um, W. Heath Robinson cartoons, you know, it's a bit hacked on there and a bit tied together there and it's all messy and life was a bit shoddy and you've got the, the blind spot in the eye, the wiring of the optic nerve goes on the, the front of the retina and no intelligent designer would do that. So it's almost like we could laugh at how bad the eye is. And we breathe and eat down the same 
tube, you know. Um, th th think of, think of um, uh, hedgehogs having sex. You know, what was God intelligent designer thinking? You know, well, what kind of intelligent designer would d do that kind of thing? So there was this trend for, for kludges, talking about evolution is, you know, it's a bit offensive talking about it's just kludging together and, you know, it's, life is really shoddy, actually. Forget the biomimicry movement. No, no, life is shoddy. It's terrible. We can laugh at life, you know. Uh, no real direction and no targets. There's a vague notion that evolution, uh, there's an increase in complexity with evolution, but um, it's kind of a vague notion. And certain targets are uh, seen, there are no fixed targets is the, the general idea because life changes all the time there are no fixed targets um, and ultimately evolution is defined as a temporal change uh, a change in gene frequencies over time and the analogy I always have is I don't know if it's a good analogy I don't have a PhD remember so uh, <laughs> the analogy I always think of is if you take a Shakespeare play and you took all the earlier drafts of a Shakespeare play you could say that final play is a uh, just a change in word frequencies over time. Well, what it is, but that doesn't get to, you know, so, so saying that defining, you know, saying a, a dragonfly or a tiger or the human cortex is, you can reduce it all to a, a change in genes over time. Yes, there might be a change in genes over time, but it doesn't really get at sort of what evolution, the, mark, the exquisite nature of, of the genius of evolution. So, um... They're just kind of, so in response to that then, that's, that's sort of negative. Oh yeah, and it's all, you notice it's all pejorative terms. Dumb, mindless, blind, selfish, degenerate, kludges, no direct, it's all negative. And if you write, I think if you write a book about evolution and you use pejorative terms, you're more likely to get a, a warm reception than if you start using positive words. For example, when, when uh, Richard Dawkins started to acknowledge uh, symbiosis, cooperation, and he acknowledged the work of Lynn Margulis, who incidentally wrote a positive blurb for my Darwin's Unfinished Business book. Um, when, he, he, when Dawkins acknowledged uh, the work of Lynn Margulis, he called her the high priestess of, uh, of symbiosis, he said that symbiosis, uh, symbiosis was essentially selfish cooperation. So it's, it's hanging on to this negative terminology. There's this negative thing, you know. Give it, Anyway, so let me just, let me, because I'm on, let me just assert this, you know, I don't care, I'm just asserting this now, right? Life, life is a naturally intelligent organic technology running on the universe. It does not use copper wire, cogs, electronic circuits and such, but rather DNA, proteins, enzymes, chemical cycles and various self-organizing molecular processes. Further, evolution is the naturally intelligent process that crafts this naturally intelligent technology. I'd like to just leave it at that and say, see you then. Yeah, that's, that's my, but I, I best go on, you know, you can't do um, So natural technology then. We can talk about natural technology. The original and best biotech. The example I, gave him, I give in my Darwin's Unfinished Business book is that if uh, scientists genetically engineer a cow to secrete insulin in its milk, right, which they have done. We, we, we say, yeah, they're really clever scientists. That's really an ingenious thing. Um, and we, f we find it remarkable. And we'll say that's a, a, an excellent example, an impressive example of biotech. But what we don't acknowledge is that m mammalian lactation itself, the ability of mammals to produce uh, highly nutritious milk on tap when it's required, we don't... That's biotech. What... what <laughs> Human biotech taps into is the original biotech, which is life. Life is a biotechnology, but it seems that only when we tap into it and manipulate it and you know, create things that are useful for, for, for human culture, then we call it biotech. But life itself is a biotech, so it's natural technology, uh, in my opinion. Um, natural design, not designoid. Uh, Dawkins, again, um, created this horrible, clumsy word, designoid, for the, the apparent design of living organisms, he invented this term designoid as in mimicking design, that it wasn't real design. Uh, re the, uh, the only real design, it has to be conscious and, and involve a forethought. It can't be sort of design that happens in the living moment and uh, maybe even be sort of an unconscious design. So um, he invented this term designoid. Well, that would mean that the biomimicry movement, they'd be designoidoid. 
because they're mimicking the mimicking of design, you know, so, which, seem, which seems crazy. But what, why can't we just talk about natural design? We've already accepted natural selection. It's normally as humans that, that, that select things. We selectively breed, you know, dogs or whatever. Um, uh, artificial selection, but we've accepted the, na- the term natural selection, the idea that nature uh, preserves and sustains certain biological behaviours or whatever. Um, we've accepted natural selection, so why can't we accept um, natural design? Um, natural intelligence, not intelligent design, supernatural intelligence. I know enough about intelligent design now. I didn't, when I first started on this paradigm, I, I I didn't really know. I've read a few intelligent design books now. The, main, the, diff, the, the intelligent design people, it's re, it is a creationist stance, and the intelligence they talk about uh, is outside of nature. It's a supernatural intelligence outside of nature that can step in, who knows why and when, step in, manipulate, come back out. and um, That's the idea. So natural intelligence, is, it's not supernatural intelligence, natural intelligence, I think, that's what, that's what life is and that's what you can talk about. And it, natural intelligence is evident everywhere, not in gaps. The creationists will keep saying, oh, we don't understand what's under that rock. Science doesn't, and then science looks under that rock, works out what's going on, so they say, oh, there's another rock over there. You know, they keep looking for these, the god of the gaps. It seems to me, if you, if you intuit some kind of intelligence, a principle of intelligence, Within, within, the, within the, the universe, it should be evident in everything. It should be evident in the laws of nature, in the forces of nature, in the Lego-like building blocks of nature, in the, in the whole system. So natural intelligence is not supernatural intelligence. It's the notion that there's a, some kind of intelligent principle within everything. So I guess it's, it's, it's pantheistic as opposed to theistic. Um, and this is interesting. Tools all the way. Tools are always associated with intelligence. We've all seen clips of chimpanzees fishing for termites, yeah? And it's always said that's tool use. So it must be some intelligence there. It's tool use. So check this out then. And this is interesting because this was on a documentary on BBC about four or five weeks ago. And I was so, it was like a synchronistic lesson. I was so struck by it that I thought I have to include it in, in this. So that's the I.I., which is a lemur from uh, Madagascar. I'm sure you've all seen it. And that middle finger there, that it's very sensitive. Apparently, the the joint is like a, it's like a shoulder joint. It can bend in different uh, different directions, and it will use it to fish for termites, right? So that is an in, it's like a, a carpenter having a drill built into his finger or something, right? <laughs> and no, the, but the interesting thing is, on this documentary, the zoologist narrator said after we'd, they showed this film of this eye eye and fishing for termite, he said, yes, that's a wonderful tool, right? Because it is a wonderful tool. That is an inbuilt, specialized tool. Um, but its eyes are tools for seeing. Its ears are tools for hearing. Its, uh, you know, its nails there are tools for, for scratching. Uh, it's, even its fur, its whiskers are tools for, for sensing objects in the dark. Even its fur is a tool for, for tr- maybe for trapping air and, and keeping warm. So what a biological organism is, is an integrated network of biological tools. And that, that, that can help connect with intelligence, because tools, um, tools are always connected with intelligence. But the interesting thing, the reason I put this in, is why do we see that I think I, I assume everyone can see that's a tool. That finger, that's you know, it's been honed by evolution. That's a specialised tool. That thing. Why do we see the tool, the f- finger, as a tool? But we don't normally talk about eyes as being tools, or ears, or the liver being a tool, or the digestive system being a tool. And I think it's because the eye, eye. I think it's only been filmed in the last sort of few decades. As high quality footage of, of the eye, eye being available, and because it's new and novel. That sta- stands out not like a sore thumb. It stands out like a specialised finger. Um, <laughs> so we notice it more. Whereas, whereas eyes, ears, and all the other stuff, we've sort of become dull to it, and we don't s- see them. That's one of the, the, the virtues, I think, of, of psilocybin and, and ayahuasca, is they allow you to see things without the old association. So you see things like for the first time. And I think that's what's happening with the eye eye, because it's a new... Species we've only seen in, with high-quality video footage recently. We 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 there, therefore see that finger as, as a as a tool, um, and so the in, so 
if, if, if you accept that an organism is an integrated network of biological tools, then given that evolution created that, led to that, shaped that, built, constructed that, honed all that, those tools, then evolution itself is a tool for making tools, which is an interesting notion. And given the evolution of evolvability, which is a term coined by uh, Dawkins again, um, which is the notion that life can facilitate its own evolution. The obvious example is the invention of se sexual reproduction to mix uh, genes. Um, so given the, the, and I think there are other, this notion of the, the evolution of evolvability, I think uh, there are lots of genetic me mechanism we, mechanisms we haven't understood yet to do with life is able to facilitate its own evolution. It's found ways to do that because it's, it's ultra smart. Um, so, given, so evolution is a tool for making tools and it, it, gets, it gets better at making tools. So that's just another way of you know, thinking about intelligence, what intelligence is and the aspects of intelligence. Um, okay, so what is intelligence? This taboo word that people have been raising. Oh, is it, you know, um, is it, where, where there's a taboo, a sort of taboo word, there's always something interesting going on in the human psyche. So what is intelligence? So the first thing I think, uh, it's a verb, a process or a behavior, not a noun. Forget about IQ tests and sort of nuts, static numbers and that. Uh, intelligence is a verb, a process or a behavior. Um, Give, and given, and yeah, the, the problem is our, our, it's interesting, our language, is there's something misleading about our language because we have nouns and verbs. So like an apple falls to the ground. But, so you've got um, noun, verb, noun. But an apple's actually a cross-section through a verb. Everything is a verb. It's a process of one kind. Everything, even a mountain, is a, going through a process. But we've... For conceptual convenience, we've, we've created nouns, but nouns are actually cross-sections through, through verb. Everything is ver a part of a process or a verb. Once you accept, if you, if you accept that intelligence is a process or a behavior, then one can, can see that it doesn't have to be restricted to the brain or mind if you see it as a process. Learning is involved with intelligence. I don't see how you can have intelligence without learning. And learning is not... Remember, not tied to duration. Think about the, the duration of evolutionary change. It's just it's vast, you know. But duration doesn't matter with learning. Think of the example I gave him on Metanoia film was if a, a six-month-old baby scored maximum points on an IQ test but took six months to get that maximum score, we would, would we ignore the baby and say, oh, it took six months? You know, of course we wouldn't. It would be, be a prodigy. It doesn't matter how long it took. And you can, similarly, you can run a, a clever computer program to solve some problem. You could run that computer, clever computer program on an old 1970s machine, and it might take weeks to, to solve the problem. Run it on a modern machine, you know, a few minutes, it's done. It's exactly the same process in either case. So into, if intelligence as a process, it, it, the learning connected with intelligence, it doesn't matter how, how long it takes. Information gaining is always involved with intelligence. There are 20,000 protein coding genes in the human genome. Every one of those genes is a specific sequence of DNA which codes for a specific sequence of amino acids which codes for a specific, uh, for a protein that will fold in a specific way. So the amount of information, and think of all the species in the, in the web of life, the amount, the, li the, the, the amount of information there, libraries and libraries worth of information, that's a massive amount of information that's been gained, uh, that ev evolving life has gained and, and stored. Um, so information gaining, learning, they're all parts of, of intelligence. Um, in, uh, information processing. Did, DNA is a digital code. This is amazing. This is not on the news every night. You know, the <laughs> DNA is a digital code. It's, it's, people don't raise eyebrows or anything. It's information processing. Um, problem solving. All the, the, as the Biomimicry Institute will say, all the problems of, of how to live and be have been solved, or, you know, most of them have been, have been solved by... Um, uh, life. So pro uh, problem solving is involved with intelligence. The making of sense, this is my favorite term terminology in the 
when I talk about or write about natural intelligence. Um, intelligence is, I think, because it's a simple way, I think everyone can grasp it. It's about <coughs> making sense. So, for instance, Michael Faraday um, was intelligent because he was able to make sense of uh, electromagnetism. A tribe in the Amazon, Amazon are intelligent because they can make sense of the forest and all the organisms and the relationship with the, of the organisms in their environment. So to be intelligent means you can, you, you can make sense of a, the larger system in which you're in. So intelligence then, I think, is um, bound up, it's a process uh, bound up with learning, information gaining, information processing, problem solving, the making of sense. Now this next one, I think might, it might be crucial, can be unconscious. This is an unusual notion that intelligence can be unconscious. Um, a year ago on this very stage, a guy called Scott Barry Kaufman talked about implicit cognition and implicit learning. And what they mean, what that means is, is unconscious learning and unconscious uh, cognition. And so you can, um, they do experiments where you can, it's getting a bit technical now. Uh, uh, I don't know if there's any more jokes to come later. Uh, you can uh, show subjects uh, what look like random letters and numbers, but there's actually a grammar to it. There's a sensibleness and intelligibility to those letters and numbers. But the subjects will not consciously perceive that or know that. But you can question them later and they'll score above chance. And what it shows is, is that we probably sense this anyway, is that beneath conscious awareness, there, there's lots of unconscious learning. There's, information is being taken in, stored, and sense is being made, but on an unconscious level. Another example would be learning... Think how hard it would be to learn Japanese. But a ch a ch possible, for, I can't even comprehend learning Japanese. But a child growing up in Japan will, will learn Japanese just, just like that. Without, it doesn't consciously know the rules of grammar and stuff, but you know, it, it will be able to learn. There are unconscious systems that will be able to learn. Another one year, when you first ride a bike... There's very complex equ equations involved to do with you know, weight and mass and all this. Kind of, you don't consciously know that, but it's being, there's in, there can be unconscious uh, learning processes and unconscious problem solving and information gaining can be unconscious. So this might be a useful way of, to, to get this paradigm into the general science uh, community, it might be, that, that, that might be a way in, the notion that intelligence can be uh, unconscious if you're talking about the intelligence of evolving life and you know, various organisms and stuff. Um, and then the last one there, what is artificial intelligence? Well, if, if artificial intelligence exists, natural intelligence must exist. Um, so what is, well, basically, artificial intelligence is uh, clever, clever robots, clever machines. So I always give the examples of uh, Mars rovers. There's generation of three. I think that's the oldest one, the littlest one, and they evolved. So there are these rovers on Mars. They're, they're in cleverly uh, constructed. They can make sense of a, an environment they've never been on before. They can navigate an environment they've never been before. They have various sensory systems, and they can take in information, and, and they can learn. Um, and so the Opportunity rover, which is up on Mars now, was recently uploaded with Aegis software by JPL, Jet Propulsion Laboratories Artificial Intelligence Group. So that shows you that the artificial intelligence group, are, uh, artificial, artificial intelligence uh, engineers and such, are interested in, in these kind of advanced robots. Um, so bearing in mind that, then artificial intelligence. Um, oh yeah, go back. Uh, the, the new software they uploaded allowed the uh, the rover to hone in on more interesting rocks. So, you know, it, it was more specialised. It, it, it would be able to analyse rocks and hone in on the ones that are more interesting. So bearing that in mind, um, intelligence is an informational process, excuse me. In an autonomous robot, intelligence will be mechanical, non-conscious, but will still involve sense-making. Intelligence implies specific information processing and specific kinds of behavior that are preserved and pursued, i.e. learned. This is exactly synonymous with evolving life. So what I'm saying is, is whenever you have an intelligent uh, system, the same principles are involved. And they're really about 
about making sense. Any system that can take in information and make sense and learn will, will embody some degree of intelligence. Uh, enter the slime mold. Um, this is just a way of, I'm sure you've all seen, heard of this uh, organism, Fasarum polycephalum. Look, it looks like a fungus, but it's actually a, a, an amoeba, I think. Um, I've never come across one in my treks. It look, it's sort of thing, it's arresting if you came across that. It looks kind of interesting. Um, so, right, they put this slime mold in a maze that it's never been into before. I think they start it off down there. Um, and it will send out tendrils to every part of the maze. Where a tendril meets a dead end and can't make sense, there's no sense to be made in a dead end, the tendril will be withdrawn. The one that, the one that makes it to the centre, it can make sense of the centre. It can make nutritious sense of it. It's sensible. That's a sensible uh, outcome. And so, and so eventually you'll get that it forms a direct route. It solves the maze. It forms a direct, direct route to the food in the centre. And this was raved about by many scientific journals. And they said, how brainless slime moulds redefine intelligence. Um, and I think, yeah, we could agree that a, 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 there's a certain degree of intelligence there. Even though it doesn't have a, a brain or a nervous system, but it's behaving, there's an intelligent process there to do with making sense. It's able to make sense of that environment. And, and all the other bits that don't lead to anything sensible don't, you know, are, are withdrawn. Now, I, I think that's, again, my opinion, I think that's almost like the slime mold recapitulates the evolutionary process. Because you can imagine the tree of life, because it varies, it's sending out tendrils and exploring different behaviours and uh, different structures. Those tendrils that don't lead to a, a sensible outcome will be like pruned away and you'll, just, you'll be left with lineages that, or biological behaviours that make sense. So I think what evolving life over time does is similar to what the slime mold does. Um, so it's just a, I thought it's an interesting analogy. Um, to get your head around this notion that it, it, the evolutionary process in terms of what it achieves and what is preserved again and again and again has intelligent characteristics, which is a, it's a very unorthodox view that. It's, a, it's heresy, really, to say that. But I think it, it needs, needs more people exploring these ideas. Uh, this, is a, this is a difficult one for me to convey. It really needs a, a, an hour in, in itself. It's the notion of targets, uh, that there are fixed targets. There are fixed targets uh, that life, uh, evolving life moves towards. For example, in uh, meta metabolism, making sense of energy. All organisms, all organisms have to metabolize. And to, to metabolize, you have to be able to make sense of the way energy flows in the universe. So because energy flows in a specific way in the universe, all forms of energy, um, because energy flows in a specific way, that means that energy flow is sensible, comprehensible, and intelligible. And so life has to kind of grip onto or hold onto uh, the sensibleness of energy flows. And so there's, there is a target there. Uh, it's difficult for me to somewhat difficult for th this part of this, this talk. Maybe this, the, the water thing is, is easier. Life has to make sense of water and uh, the sensible properties of water. The sensible, comprehensible and intelligible properties of water are a, a fixed target that life has to learn about. So for instance, in trees you have a xylem, which uh, inside the xylem there are these microscopically thin tubes and water, water will evaporate from leaves and through uh, capillary action and the cohesiveness of water molecules and, of, and, of, and evaporation, these thin columns of water will be drawn up to all parts of the tree. So the tree can get water to every part of, the, uh, every, every part of itself without actually expending energy. So the specific structure of those... Uh, vessels within the water, their specific shape and their, their, their dimensions are built around the sensible properties of water. Life has to, and that's just, there's osmosis as well, life has to, the fixed target, it's like nature's, a, uh, the larger system of nature is like a book and, li and life is perforce, has to learn how to sort of read the book. So there are fixed targets. Uh, with the water one, if the temperature in here now went up to 45 or 50 degrees, we'd all die unless we 
lost heat through sweating. So the, the heat control via sweating, the physiological mechanisms of sweating to, to control heat, the physiology is built around, this, again, the sensible, comprehensible, and intelligible properties of water. And they're fixed. The properties of water, it's the, water the properties of water are, are fixed, and life has to grip and build itself around them. Um, convergent evolution. The eye is evolved about over 20 times, I think, in various parts of the tree of life. Even though there are different... Uh, structures to, to see, like the compound eye of an insect or this kind of eyes we have, all visual systems are built around the sensible, comprehensible and intelligible property of light, of photons. So again, the, the sensible properties of light are a target around which life builds itself around and holds onto. You can think a metaphor is, the, instead of talking about the tree of life, or the web of life, you can talk about the vine of life. And what it's holding on to is this a priori sensibleness of the larger system. Um, so targets are inherent in the larger system of nature within which evolving life is embedded. Life has learned how to live and be by grasping the sensibleness of the targets. I've put that in because it connects up to this natural intelligence paradigm. All right, so the, the, the argument against all this uh, would be, well, surely life is just stuff doing interesting things. And I've got that impression from t talking to biologists on forums and stuff. I think that is a, a typical way a biologist might see life. It's, it's stuff doing interesting things. And you might, you might compare it to a snow... When a, when a snowflake forms, you could say that was water doing interesting things when it freezes. Right, and that, that I showed that at the beginning. It's a, a jellyfish uh, drawn by Ernst Haeckel. Um, you know, it looks similar to us. You could say, well, just like water does interesting things when it, it encounters a freezing temperature, forms these complex patterns, then maybe matter and energy simply forms these uh, complex uh, structures. And it's just stuff doing interesting things. Nothing more. You know, don't have to be bringing in flowery language like intelligence and, and, and acumen and, and you know, technology and all that kind of thing. Just stuff doing interesting things. But for, for a snowflake to be truly lifelike, right? Imagine a truly lifelike snowflake. You'd be able to carry it around in a matchbox. It would be able to sustain itself whatever the temperature was outside. You'd be able to break off pieces of it and it would repair itself. You could take it to the, your matchbox to the Sahara Desert, open it and the the snowflake would still be inside and it would be able to sustain itself. Um, so in order to do that, it would have to, and it, you could break a piece off and it would repair itself. In order to do that, it would have to have nanotechnological machinery inside it, just like a, a cell. So it would have to be able to, to gain energy. It would have to ha sense the external temperature. It would have to be manipulating molecules and this kind of thing. So it would have to have nanotech inside, a truly lifelike uh, snowflake that could sustain itself in, this, in any condition. Um, and nanotech is stuff doing clever things, i.e. stuff behaving in a sensible and intelligent way. So what I'm saying is, is no, life is not just stuff doing interesting things. It's stuff doing sensible and intelligent things. That, that's my point. All right, so the essence of intelligence then. Boil intelligence down to the art of making sense via information processing in which the main, the main targets are fixed does not need to be conscious. There can be unconscious intelligence. Preserved express DNA is a digital code for sensible life-enhancing behavior. And then I've, I would be descent by... Darwin defined evolution as descent by... descent with modification. I would be so bold as to su suggest it's descent by way of sensible genetic modifications. Those modifications in genes that lead to some life-affirming sensible, life-affirming <coughs> behavior. It's an important word, sensible. Um, evolving life is an intelligence in the business of making sense because in order to live and be and reproduce, you need to be able to make sense via biologic. Or evolution is a naturally intelligent process that generates naturally intelligent systems of biologic. Thus, Orgel, Leslie Orgel was a biochemist and his famous second rule was uh, evolution is cleverer than you are. It's always worth bearing in mind that. 
And uh, you often hear about the ingenuity of life, the biomimicry movement talk about life's genius. They're all more, more than metaphors. There is an in intelligence there. We really need to take it on board, you know. It's important. It's something, it's sometimes things all come to, down to language and certain words, and we really need to start. This notion that it's only us, it's our word, you know, design, technology, and intelligence. It's us. It's just us, you know. But we, the, really, we've come human intelligence. Conscious human intelligence sits on a vast pyramid of uh, biological intelligence. So I think there's been a 200-year-old uh, pendulum swing from Paley to Dawkins. Uh, Paley was, I think he was called William Paley, was the guy who came up with a watch, that, uh, this a couple hundred years ago, that a what, um, an organism is so well adapted to the environment, it must be, uh, does, there must be a designer. Um, and, he, and, and Darwin actually studied Paley's, it's called natural theology, I think, Darwin himself studied, was taken by Paley's arguments. But then, of course, Dar Darwin went on to, to discover the methodology of, of how these designs occur. Um, so there's been like a 200-year pendulum swing from the sort of creationist, religious, uh, theist view to Dawkins and sort of hardcore uh, atheist you know, reductionism. Um, but we should remember that this in, in terms of hermeneutics, how we, do, how we interpret life and evolution. How we view life determines how we live life. So pa pa hermeneutics is important. Our interpretations, if our interpretations are lacking in some way, then it's worth exploring other in interpretations. Nothing, there's no sort of new data. It's just a different perspective. So run by... Homo arrogantus, uh, the kingdom of human culture does not fit in with the other kingdoms of life. There is no regenerative symbiosis. Really simple example, a European oak forest. In, in the autumn, the leaves fall down. All this leaf litter, if, if that wasn't recycled, event, after hundreds of generations, you know, the forest would drown in its own leaf litter. So worms come and they digest the leaves, two kingdoms there. There are bacteria inside the worm's guts that help the, to break down the leaf litter. That's three kingdoms. And fungi break down dead wood. There's four kingdoms there. In that simple example, you've got four kingdoms of life symbiotically, naturally, intelligently entwined. Human culture is not like that. What, if we, what, what runs... We, we're more like a, a, a leech, a, a parasite that just takes and takes and takes and doesn't regenerate. That's why we're in the crisis we're in. Um, and what, what make, I mean, ultimately, what makes the human world go round, as it has done for time immemorial, is money and wealth. But what makes the biosphere go round is natural intelligence. So until human culture uh, embodies the same, fits in with the larger web of life, we'll be kind of we'd be doomed. We can't, we have to be, re, we have to, form a symbiotic relationship with the rest of the web of life. It, it, we have to, you know. Business as usual can't carry on indefinitely. What's wrong with this picture? You often see this. This is hubris. Right, we're not... G given the ecosystem services, given the, the vast amount of uh, wisdom inherent in the web of life, the idea that we, we control our future... We might go down the pan and take millions of species with us, but as Lynn Margulis said, Gaia is a tough bitch, and we'll, car we'll, car <laughs> we'll carry on with or without us. So th this notion that we're in control of the bi it's not. We're, the biosphere is holding us. We're not in control. And so this is, this is hubris, but you see it all the time. Waking up to Spaceship Earth. This was a term... Spaceship Earth was a term coined, I think, by uh, Buckminster Fuller. He saw life as a technology. He saw the universe, actually, as a technology as well. And, and it is, given the advanced, if you take on board natural intelligence, given the advanced nature and the vast amount of natural intelligence uh, in the web of life, evinced by the web of life, and that it supports us, it is like a spaceship, a highly advanced spaceship. It is life support systems, you know. 
But we're like, we're just sort of dreaming about, you know, celebrity and wealth and stuff, totally oblivious to this, you know, this larger, naturally in intelligent system that's, that's keeping us alive. So I just put that in because I thought it was interesting. Um, yeah, and the last, last ones then. Uh, we are not stewards of the earth, but apprentices. You often hear this phrase that we're stewards and caretakers and stuff. We're not. We, we, we need to... I'm arguing, although I don't have a PhD, I'll say it again. Uh, it's just a, my point of view, you know, take, take it or leave it. Um, if you take on board the natural intelligence paradigm and see that we're, that human, conscious human intelligence sits on top of an immense web of already extant uh, biological and ecological intelligence, then we have to, we're not st uh, stewards or gardeners or whatever, we're apprentices and we have to, we have to learn, you know, learn from the, this ancient um, wisdom that's already there. And uh, yeah, the last thing then, we are natural intelligence in its latest expression and we just don't know it yet. And there ends my hermeneutical uh, discourse. Of <laughs>
whether we really can sustain something, given, given what's in here, we can sustain something at the scale well, of what we're trying here. Well, I, I, I think we have to. We've reached that point in human history where you can't, you can't have business as usual anymore. You can't have concepts as usual. You can't have consciousness as usual anymore. It's all, it's all got to change, I think. So I, d I don't know what the solutions are. You know, I, I, don't, I don't know. I just, I just play with ideas and stuff. But um, I think if enough people are interested in these ideas, and it's, there must, there's got to be a lot of global interest, then, and it has to be coordinated as well because there's 7 billion people. We're all, it's all connected, you know. So um, hopefully solutions will emerge. And there'd have to be cooperation and symbiosis on a global scale, I guess. But you, we can't, act, it's got to be a radical change. Even maybe this forum needs to change. We, li we live in such, mm -hmm. such, you know, the weather's changing, not in the UK here. It's, and it's only going to get worse, I think. We can't carry on with business as usual. Everything, uh, culture has to change direction, you know. As to how that happens, I, d I don't know, you know. Ideas, they say ideas are the most important thing, don't they? But it, you know, affection is underrated. Hmm? I think affection is underrated. Yeah. Maybe one more. I was wondering, were you here yesterday? Yeah. After all the talks yesterday, um, would you say that there might be Homo arrogantus um, uh, living more in the West and less in other parts of the world? Yeah, undoubtedly. <laughs> That's why I always liked. I remember I was always struck by. I always liked American Indian sayings, you know, some of those classic sayings of Ameri from American Indian chiefs, and there was something so uncontrived about them, whereas in the West we have, like, false personality and trying to look cool and all this kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, there's a lot to be, as some of the talks said, there's a lot to be uh, learned from indigenous peoples who are closer to the, to the natural intelligence, you know. They might not call it that, but, you know. Okay. Uh, Simon? Okay. Okay.